Ramaki. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Labour will be uh, supporting the Maritime Transport Amendment Bill portion of this marine legislation, and we will be opposing the Exclusive Economic Continental Shelf Environmental Effects Bill portion of this marine legislation. If I could start with the part of the bill that we do support, the Maritime Transport Amendment Bill. Um, the question would really have to be why it has taken the government so long to pass this legislation. Uh, when the RENA disaster occurred two years ago, uh, New Zealand's taxpayers were lumped with uh, enormous costs uh, that we, and, and the risk of, of even more had the negotiations with the companies involved not been successful uh, because we had not ratified uh, the International Bunker Convention. Now, a select committee in 2008 uh, recommended to government that they ratify that convention as soon as possible, and it has taken until now, in 2013, for the government to do anything about that. So due to this government's failure to ratify that convention, um, when the arena uh, crashed on the reef of Tauranga, uh, it was only liable to pay 11.3 million of the total clean-up costs, which were more than 50 million, and it was New Zealand taxpayers that ended up picking up the rest of that tab. Now, had we ratified that convention, the total cap that we could have claimed back uh, would have been lifted, and we were, the Crown was able to secure uh, $27.6 million uh, through negotiation with the companies, but it shouldn't have to take months and months of negotiating to come to an outcome uh, which would have been achieved absolutely by right had that convention been signed because the cap would have been lifted and that 27 million would have been absolutely unquestionably provided so that New Zealand taxpayers wouldn't have had to have funded that. So uh, the government, you know, recently was saying, well, it was a good outcome, we, we got what we would have got anyway. Well, it took a lot of money, a lot of time and a lot of stress, particularly for those business owners around Tauranga, which didn't need to happen and shouldn't have happened. So we're pleased this legislation is finally passing. But I, I have to say, we've passed a whole lot of really dire legislation that this should have been ahead of. We've passed a lot of legislation which is not nearly as important as this uh, maritime transport amendment piece of legislation. Um, and the minister, in his third reading speech, mentioned that this legislation does set a blood alcohol level of 0.05 uh, for ships. Uh, and my question to the minister would be, why not for cars as well then? Why is the government so absolutely adamant in their refusal to reduce the uh, drink driving limit from 0.08, 0.05, and the minister says the minister says it's because people don't drive cars on the ocean. People don't drive cars on the ocean. Well, that's one of the more lucid reasons I've heard for why the National Party isn't supporting uh, my colleague Ian Lees Galloway's uh, members' bill. And anyone who saw Seven Sharp last night, for those people who weren't watching Minister Simon Bridges imploding on Campbell Live, there was actually a really good item on Seven Sharp where a couple of staff members from TVNZ drank enough to get them to 0.05 and then to 0.08. This is in the bill. We changed the blood alcohol limit from 0.08 to 0.05 for ships. Um, and what we're saying is if it applies to ships, it should also apply to cars, because what was no, clear no, no, no. was that even at 0.05, they were still significantly impaired. And when they did... Um, when they were doing a driving simulation, I think one of them killed a deer yeah, uh, at 0.05, and then at 0.08, a pedestrian. So we're just saying that if it's, all brew, if it, if, if it's, if it's Not good enough for ships, Mr Speaker, <laughs> then it should be good enough for cars. No, this is completely, completely lacking in any rational explanation as to why it should apply to ships but not apply to cars, especially when you see the death rate on our roads from that, that alcohol causes. Um, so we are pleased to see this Maritime Transport Amendment Bill um, finally passing, but again, I say it should have happened a lot sooner. But the bit that I want to focus on are the changes to the Exclusive Economic Zone legislation. Uh, and this is just yet another greasing of the wheels for industry from a government that has no other plan for regional New Zealand other than oil and gas exploration. That's all they have. That's all they have. And so what they've done is consistently embarked on a program of weakening environmental protections, of locking the public out from having any say in what is occurring off their coastlines, uh, and in arrogantly ignoring some very, very valid concerns uh, that the public hold around the dangers associated with deep sea oil drilling. And some of the depths that we're talking about now in New Zealand are, are, are not depths that have been seen around the world. Uh, and so I think that those communities have a right to say, to have a say through a process 
uh, of issuing the marine consent under the exclusive economic zone legislation, to have their say about the concerns, to have those concerns acknowledged, and to have the EPA actually have to consider them. And so what you have now is out to um, 12 nautical miles, that's our territorial waters, that's where the RMA applies. So the public do get to have their say through a submission process. The government's trying to take that away, uh, but fortunately they don't have the numbers to do that at the moment. Uh, we have an RMA process that's well tested, 20 years of case law behind it. There are appeals to the Environment Court on substance, not just on um, process. Uh, and there is a submission process where affected communities can have their say about what is going on. We think the RMA is a good piece of legislation, notwithstanding the changes that the government uh, want to make to it. And then once you get to 12 nautical miles, we head into our exclusive economic zone. Now, New Zealand doesn't actually have the right to exploit uh, any of the resources there unless there is a regulatory regime in place. And that's what the exclusive economic zone legislation, which passed late last year, um, does. Uh, but unfortunately, unlike the RMA, there is no ability for appeals to the Environment Court. Uh, there is very ambiguous language which has not been tested in the courts. We asked why we couldn't just pick up the well-tested language of the RMA as an indication that we expected that two regimes operating side by side uh, in our ocean, where the line that divides them is jurisdictional only, that it would make sense to use similar language, similar processes, so that regional councils, uh, so that the companies that currently deal with regional councils in our territorial waters in Taranaki know that basically the same standards are going to apply in the exclusive economic zone. And I note that when the Taranaki Regional Council submitted on that bill, they said that, that, that actually that would be helpful to have more guidelines. What we have is an incredibly laissez-faire piece of legislation, a very permissive piece of legislation in our exclusive economic zone. We voted against it the whole way through, Mr Bennett, actually. Um, because unlike you, we read the legislation. Um, and what that showed, uh, and I think that's counterintuitive to what most New Zealanders would expect. I think most New Zealanders would expect that actually the deeper you go out, the more rigorous the regulation. But in fact, what we have in New Zealand is the deeper you go out, the more permissive the regulation. And so from our perspective, that simply doesn't make sense and it doesn't provide the environmental protections and those bottom lines that New Zealanders want to know are there if this activity is going to go ahead in our exclusive economic zone. And I mean, depth is not the only factor. Um, there's the, whether it's not seis it's seismically active, there's the geology of the area, uh, there's the, the size of the actual um, res reserve that might be discovered. There's a whole lot of things that need to be factored in. What we need is robust risk analysis in our exclusive economic zone, and this does not provide it. And when a number of these concerns were raised at select committee, um, the Minister at the time, uh, of Minister of Energy and Resources, Phil Heatley, at the time, um, said, you know what, and he said this to the people in Kaikoura, who were very concerned that there's a very deep trench about 100 kilometres off the coast of Kaikoura, uh, where uh, the exploration work is going to start this summer. And they were very, very concerned about the permissive nature of the exclusive economic zone regulation. They were very concerned around the EPA's capability to actually issue these marine consents. Uh, this is an organisation that doesn't have any internal investigative capability, so they're going to have to go out and look for it. And what did Minister Heatley say uh, to the people of Kaikoura? He said, don't worry, you'll get to have your say during the submission process for the marine consent. You will get to have your say during the submissions process for the marine consent. David Bennett really doesn't even understand what's in this bill. This is actually in the bill, Mr Bennett, that you are about to vote for, where you are taking away taking away the right of people in this country to have a say over exploratory drilling by the creation of this new uh, discretionary non-notified category. Mr Bennett, Phil Heatley promised the people of New Zealand that it would be notified, that exploratory drilling would be notified, and this legislation creates the very category that is going to take that right away. So now you have an EPA process where they are not going to have the benefit of the submissions that come from individuals, from NGOs, from independent technical experts who take an interest in this thing, and they will no longer have that. They have no internal investigative capability. NIWA, who is the organisation that they will go to to do it, have been contracted to the oil industry. And I don't know whether NIWA, in that contractual arrangement, are actually able to then provide advice also to the EPA. It may well be that they can't. So the very organisations that are expert in this country have already been contracted to the oil industry because the government cut their funding and told them they had to go out and get those commercial contracts. So where is this information going to come from that the EPA is going to be making incredibly important decisions? 
And as we saw on Campbell Live last night, and as we've been pointing out consistently, we don't have the capability to respond if something goes wrong in deep sea. We have three vessels, they're eight metres long each. One is in Northland, one is in Auckland, one is in Picton, and when they're going top speed at full capacity, they go at 12 kilometres an hour. So the idea that they're going to be able to get out to the trench off the Kaikoura coast is absolutely, uh, absolutely not true, and we will be opposing Sorry, members, strongly time has expired. the exclusive economic zone mm. portion of this legislation. I call David Bennett. That was a very poor speech from that member that um, had a very limited understanding of this bill.